so my name is Casper, and I'm from the University of Nottingham. Uh, most of this work was done uh, while uh, together with Eugene Polsig at the Niels Bohr Institute. So first an outline. So I would like to tell uh, just very briefly about our cesium magnetometer. Uh, just one slide, you know a lot about magnetometers already. It will be a little bit more later. Then I'll tell you about biomedical applications. Uh, first some work on detecting the heartbeat, which was published uh, last year. Uh, and then to the main topic, which is um, towards imaging the heart's electrical conductivity. This shows a picture of the vapor cells we are using. It's uh, based on room temperature cesium atomic vapor. So we have the metallic cesium here. It evaporates at room temperature and fills this uh, volume. The cell is paraffin coated on the inside. It means atoms move a lot in there. And in the end, we're going to measure the average field inside this five millimeter cubic volume. Um, yeah. The key feature is it's quite small. Uh, this one is five millimeter. We have some which are as small as 0.3 millimeter diameter. And of course, some bigger ones, more like one inch. We always operated at room or human body temperature. Uh, this is nice for biological measurements because you can put something biological very close to it, uh, almost touching, just at a millimeter or less distance. And we achieved high sensitivity uh, with this type of cesium magnetometer. Uh, the best we had was uh, below a femtotesla per root hertz. That was for detection of uh, oscillating magnetic fields when we detect uh, uh, more slower varying field, it's uh, a, a bit worse sensitivity. Now already I'll start with the, our results on detecting the heartbeat. So the functioning of the heart is based on electrical signals, which you can typically measure by placing electrodes on, on the chest of a person and measure the electrocardiogram. Here shows an example of that. Uh, so all the spikes from that you can infer the heart rate. The spikes are called QRS complex, and then there's other features like uh, the P wave and T wave. And those features are important for diagnostic purposes. All those uh, electrical signals, they have associated magnetic fields, which we can measure with the sensitive magnetometer. Uh, magnetometry is non-invasive, so you can infer what's going on inside the heart by detecting outside. So that's a main advantage. Uh, in particular, if you want to detect things like the fetal heartbeat, uh, this is very nice to do with magnetometers because you cannot uh, immediately place electrodes on a fetus. Um, this thing is already possible. Uh, people have tried it with a, or can do it with squids and also more recently with the optically pumped magnetometer. So I haven't worked with the people, instead I work with the animal and animal experiments. So this is an isolated animal heart from a guinea pig. It's roughly two centimeter in size. It's a similar size to the human fetus, which is 20 weeks old. Uh, we place it in the, I should say the guinea pig, it's very similar to a human in terms of the heartbeat. So it's very widely used uh, in uh, biomedical studies. Uh, it looks more similar to the human heartbeat compared to, for instance, a, a rat. Um, it's placed in this uh, plastic chamber and it's perfused with water, with oxygen, and it's uh, just hanging there and beating, and it's alive for, for hours. Uh, it's important to keep the stable temperature around 37 degrees for it to have, uh, feel well. The thing here is put on a long stick and uh, placed inside the cylindrical magnetic shield. There's a vapor cell here, the same as before, and you put it uh, as close to it as possible. Uh, of course, there are holes in the cylindrical shield, so we can have our laser beams uh, going through the cell and also detectors outside. And then we can re record the magnetic field from this uh, beating guinea pig heart. So this is the main result. It shows in real time the signal from our magnetometer in uh, magnetic field units. So we see the big sp spikes here, roughly three a second. So uh, it's a, a heart rate of this uh, guinea pig heart. And then we have the other features called P wave uh, and T wave, which are very important for the diagnostic purposes. Uh, 
Our paper here from last year was done together with the medical researchers and we also did some uh, medical experiments uh, looking at time intervals, uh, uh, QT time in intervals, and we uh, did some uh, medical experiments on this heart. Okay. So now to the main topic, which is uh, working towards imaging the heart's electrical conductivity. The whole heart is based on electrical conduction uh, so obviously the electrical conductivity must have an important role in, the, in how the heart works. And there was an idea by Luca Mamucci and Ferrucci Ronzoni uh, about using an array of optical magnetometers to uh, image the conductivity of the heart in three dimensions. And this could be useful for, let's say, screening of several heart diseases, including this atrial fibrillation. Um, one issue is that even though the heart is based on electrical conduction, the conductivity sigma is quite small, roughly one Siemens per meter or a bit less. Compared to copper, it's 60 million times smaller. So would, one could imagine it will be small signals and difficult to detect. So in this study, we didn't uh, use hearts. We started at something a bit easier so that, and more uh, yeah, more stable. So we had small containers with salt water, has a similar conductivity as a heart, or in this range, 0 to 24 Siemens per meter. So the higher value is when the water is fully saturated with salt. And this is somehow easier to study than the living beating heart. So we start with that. The way you get signals is by inducing and detecting eddy currents. So suppose you have a piece of conductive material and you have a coil, you drive it with the alternating current, it produces a magnetic field which is called the primary field. Uh, due to the Faraday law of induction, eddy currents are generated in the material and produce a secondary magnetic field, which you can then measure with the same coil or another coil or another magnetometer. Uh, you can imagine you scan things around or you have an array and you build up an image this way. So, as an alternative to the pickup coils, you can use an optical magnetometer. It might be a good idea because we know they have very high sensitivity at, uh, a, lot, uh, at a wide frequency range, from DC to, to megahertz. And uh, these are some data by Anne Wickenbock and others where they have different uh, plates here, uh, copper, titanium, uh, aluminum, and copper nickel, and they scan uh, uh, their material around and they get some images recorded with the optically pumped magnetometer and uh, they see a kind of nice edges and the shape of the thing and they uh, get different brightness so more conductive objects will most likely be brighter and you can infer conductivity and material properties this way. Now to our work on the detection of salt water so as I said the goal is to detect something with low conductivity starting with salt water and then in the future uh, biological tissue. We have this uh, container here with salt water, uh, quite small, and a coil one which uh, generate a primary field oscillating at the frequency omega which is typically one or two megahertz. And that will induce eddy currents in this salt water. Our cesium magnetometer here will detect uh, the primary field and the uh, feel from the eddy currents. Due to the low conductivity, the feel from the eddy current will be pretty small and will be also be out of phase with the primary field. So if the primary field is oscillating like a cosine, the secondary field will oscillate like a sine. Uh, the ratio of the amplitudes here, uh, typically uh, we estimate uh, one part in 10,000, so it's quite small. We have small signals, and there's a formula here how things scale. So A is a geometrical factor, and uh, there's a, signals will be proportional to conductivity, frequency, and uh, magnetic permeability here. So now just a slide on how the magnetometer works. I just uh, told you a little bit. So suppose you don't have the container there, but just you have your coil and your magneto magnetometer. This is uh, schematics, so we have optical pumping, 
with circular polarized light in the, this direction along a static field and you have a probe light along the other direction and we measure the Faraday rotation and it gives us a, a signal on our balanced photo detector. There are a static field, B0, that gives us a lambda frequency, typically one or two megahertz, and then there's this uh, oscillating field uh, uh, which we can detect. Uh, and of course there has to be some resonance, so the frequency here has to roughly match the lambda frequency to get uh, a signal. This is a level scheme and the laser, laser wavelengths. So we have pump and repump, uh, two lasers for optical pumping to get uh, relatively high polarization, spin polarization, and we have the off resonant uh, linearly polarized probe light. These are the uh, signals we record. So the, from the photo detector, we use a lock-in detection and we get the in-phase and out-of-phase component. Here they are called X and Y. See, I think, uh, we saw that in a previous talk as well. And there's a Laurentian line shape and somewhat dispersive line shape and then a little bit bumps here from the nonlinear Siemens effect. So this is when we scan the frequency, uh, small omega. Uh, if they are on resonant, I'll just show you a figure of signal and noise. So here I plotted uh, the X and Y in the, this uh, 2D plot. On resonance, we have a big value for X and zero in Y. So it's uh, out here. And then there's a lot of noise we see experimentally uh, in this direction. Uh, and uh, the reason for that is uh, quite common noise in our magnetometer. It's uh, instability of the current source driving the, the coil that makes a static field. So this is something uh, you c it's difficult to get around. Uh, and it's very big. Uh, when you place the salt water there, you should see a signal from the eddy currents in the y direction, means uh, all these points should move a little bit down by a tiny factor. And this will uh, not be detectable, it will be drowned in noise. So that's obviously a problem. So to solve this, we introduce a second coil down here, which at the magnetometer position makes the opposite field of that, that coil. Uh, it's still far away from the salt water, so it doesn't induce any eddy currents there. So this is a signal we get with just the one coil on, the first coil on. These are the signals we get with the second coil turned on and the first one off. They're just 180 degree out of phase or opposite. And then when they are both on, we get all the data points here in the center. And they, uh, at this scale, you cannot see the noise, but of course there's a scatter of something like 10,000 points there. Um, and we see more than a factor of 1,000 reduction in noise with this uh, procedure. And now, if, if the data points move a little bit down in the y direction, we can easily see that. Now it's just a matter of doing it. So we take the container here, we scan it over the top coil, and whenever it's on top, a significant amount of eddy currents will be generated, and we can detect that down here. So this shows an out-of-phase component for different concentration of salt, and we see a nice dip whenever this is on top of the coil uh, due to the eddy currents in the salt water. And these are the kind of real-time traces with the, with the um, translation state moving across the coil. If we can do a little bit of filtering, we can also average uh, 10, 20 times, and we get uh, uh, more low-noise quality signals here. Uh, again, roughly one part in 10,000. We are detecting kind of small signals, so we want to make sure we measure the right thing. So we can vary the conductivity of the salt water by adding more or less salt, and we see a nice linear scaling, uh, just as we expect from our formula. We can also vary the operating frequency, like half, one, uh, one and a half, and two megahertz. Again, we see the nice linear scaling. Uh, there's a limit kind of to how much, uh, how big this frequency can be because we have to have a very high uh, static field, require a lot of current, and uh, we had a, a limit here for us. Finally, we vary the amplitude of the primary field, would be this B1, and the signal should scale linearly with that, but there is some saturation. Uh, we still need to figure exactly out what's going on with that. These are just a summary. 
So just to be very quick, uh, showed the heartbeat detection of that, uh, working towards the conductivity, still challenges. We always want better sensitivity and also a magnetometer array would be really nice for doing imaging. We have uh, postdoc and PhD positions uh, in Nottingham. Both me and my colleague Thomas Fernholz he has a student, uh, Tadas, who gives a poster here also on magnetometry. So you're welcome to contact me if you're interested. And thanks for listening.